nice to us. We wanted to Mr. Usman Fall before the lecture begins. Mr. Fall. Bonjour, serment public. C'est avec euh, énorme plaisir que je viens appeler cette tâche qui m'est confiée par la direction de Code CA ici à Dakar. Qui s'agit de faire des. It is about doing some instrument presentation, some music uh, all along your stay here in Dakar. I'm going to entertain you with some choral music. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, so it's it's a real pleasure for me to be here and to be in collaboration with Cordesia here in Dakar. And I hope that uh, the uh, music that I'm going to play, oh, you will like them. Uh, because on the first day, the people who were here, I, I felt that the uh, musical uh, notes were very good for them, and I would like they like my music, and I will continue in the same vein uh, during all your stay here in this hotel. Uh, so bear with me. Let me give me welcome this afternoon or this evening. I'm going to sing a song. Uh, which dates back to a long time. This is called Tubaka. Tubaka is a nickname that was given to a dancer who was not a, a storyteller. You know that in the past, uh, the dancing and the songs uh, were the business of the storytellers uh, or the drum beaters. Uh, and just like, uh, as you know, uh, the music is just like a virus that can uh, uh, affect anybody. So, and I myself, uh, uh, personally, I am not a storyteller at all. Uh, I am not a griot, but it is the uh, storytellers have taught us how to play the chora. And I am also born from a musician family. My father, who was the famous guitar player, Obama Mali musician, and my elder brother, Amadou Fala, as well, was also the core player for Obama Mal. I was a student here at the UK. But, you know, destiny has made that I have become a core yeah, instead. and I uh, left my studies, and this is my work. Let's go back to our song, Tubaka. Tubaka, this young boy uh, who was given the name of nickname of Tubaka because he used to dance and to sing at the same time. Uh, he was somebody who was hated by his family because he was not uh, uh, a storyteller, but through his uh, brother, he was a uh, 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 thrown away out of his village because of the work, the job that he was doing as a storyteller. And this is the song I wanted to sing. Was you? It is that context that can explain. So I want you to listen carefully to what I'm going to sing now. Tubaka.
Merci beaucoup, M. Fall. Merci beaucoup, M. Fall. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Fall. I uh, hope that uh, this is uh, going to help you forget all the problems that you had since you came here in Dakar. And that is going also to help you to forgive Kodazuya for all the problems that you have faced. So, Professor Kolonle, Excellent Bombaki, and uh, Deputy President of Kodazuya, you have the floor. Excellency, Mr. President, so I would like to say thank you for having uh, accepted to be with here today here in this uh, room. So, and you have shown once again your support. So we are grateful to that. Uh, And gentlemen, dear friends, good afternoon to you all. Bonsoir and bon dia. So you are the members of a community which is uh, working for common good. And uh, this is of humanity. To honor also the to honor the memory of our devoted people, people a way to make uh, their souls immortal. And as you know, just like me, in that tradition, the access to immortality is not unconditional in Africa since the ancient Egypt immortality Immortality is conditional because the souls that have been through the oath of that, of that tribunal of, or the court of jurists, as it is said in the days, are able to access those. The executive committee of Cordesvia. Executive Committee of Kodastuya has done granted this uh, privilege to okay, uh, who is the former chair of uh, Kodastuya in the mid uh, 1980s. Uh, who is Claude Ake? Claude Ake in 1939. Uh, he passed away at an early uh, 1996, so he died at the age of 56 years old. He uh, was a politologue from Nigeria. Uh, he was a very known politologue. Uh, he was okay, uh, was one of the uh, major figure in Africa. Uh, he was, as you know, certainly, uh, uh, and this is just a reminder for the young He was an economy, has worked a lot uh, on the uh, issues of uh, developed AK was the chancellor, vice chancellor of the Social Science University of Port Ake. Ake has got a brilliant international career. He uh, was uh, teaching, he has, he has taught, he taught in very, he taught in the University of Yale, the USA, in the University of Nairobi, in Zenia, and of course uh, in the University of Port Ake. Uh, Claude Ake uh, simply academics, a uh, lecturer. He was also somebody uh, who was uh, a political activist uh, who committed uh, in the 
Israel, and you remember very well his uh, stances, his uh, political positions, his strong political positions on the on undermining the uh, Niger Delta for quite a while, uh, and which uh, uh, at the end of, his of the execution of Ken Sariwa, he was killed in 1995. He had taken a very strong position to condemn that uh, execution of Ken Sariwa. Okay, uh, has made a lot of publications, uh, and it is what is why the uh, uh, community and the global scientific community wanted to pay a tribute to him. Could uh, okay, uh, has been not just in Africa, also throughout the world, and that is the reason why. Uh, on peace uh, and was upset in the Britain uh, has uh, uh, created a kind of a chair for Claude Ake and I am Claude and uh, beyond those researchers, all the African researchers uh, to pay for that they give important uh, scholarship uh, for the K is something someone we are very proud of uh, known at international uh, level at international level and the fact that he is, is a responsible that we have of uh, so we have uh, we're going to devote this session to and also given uh, some other sessions to other unknown people who have passed away. Uh, we are not uh, going to look for uh, very far. We said that some of the success of Claude Ake uh, to the position of uh, chair of Cordesia. We want this uh, tribute to be placed, and that's why we have asked that Madame de Fassa, Jodi Chikata, uh, who is chairman of uh, CON2, to make this tribute to Claude Ake uh, through a conference that she is going uh, to Madame Professor uh, and dear colleagues. I would like to invite you to here to deliver your keynote to the speaker. Your keynote speech. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Nkolofu. Good evening, President Tabundeki. Dear colleagues, first and foremost, I want to thank you most sincerely because I think we've had a very long day, so um, I appreciate that to, to, uh, to this lecture. The one person I most keenly regret is not here at this lecture. I dedicate this effort is Samuel, mentor, comrade, and brother. Sam, who in addition to his prodigious scholarship on agrarian change in Africa and Zimbabwe, and his mentoring of a whole new generation of intellectuals, was the moving spirit behind the Agrarian South Network, a thriving tri-continental network of progressive agrarian scholars in America. Many of his leading African members, including myself, Issa Shiv share primary kinship forged at Odessia. To my mind, this is only one more example of in fostering new networks and partnerships, a function which places Odessia of intellectual endeavor within the social sciences and the humanities in Africa. It is only appropriate that this is the Claude Ake fortune of meeting Claude Ake in person, and I'm probably the first president of Kodesia not 
to have done this too. However, his old name in the social sciences for his work on democracy and development in Africa, and is considered by some to be one of the foremost political philosophers. So, of course, I have encountered his work. We read in him as I contemplate my lecture. I've been struck by his courageous efforts at theorizing important subjects such as development and class relations in Africa's social formations. Most pertinent for this lecture is his article titled Notes on the Political Economy of Unemployment in Africa, where he addresses one of the most challenging and troubling questions we face today as a continent, the crisis of unemployment and the informalization of work and the concomitant waste of young lives and the ingenuity and spirit of the working peoples of Africa. I can note that the integral nature of the relationship between rural and urban unemployment Why he also flags questions of youth unemployment? He doesn't take these two lines of inquiry in the analysis. Less important than what is not what this event, a timeless call to continue to produce relevant and critical knowledge that we should heed in our response as Africans. Beyond his scholarship, and this is something Claudaki shared with some, what was Akis firm clean the daily struggles of Africa in their social movement while using his scholarship to support their strivings for a better life through policy engagement. Sadly, they were both rudely taken from us at the height of their powers. When their projects, the Center for Advanced Social Science in Port Harcourt and the African Institute for Agrarian Studies in Harare were beginning to gain influence and recognition for their contributions to knowledge production and their support for social movements. The subject matter of my lecture, the land and labor questions of agrarian transformation in Africa, is inspired by renewed concerns about the future of Africa's agriculture and its role in achieving structural autonomies of sub-Saharan Africa when it is in a state of stagnation dominated by poor smallholders in most African countries. In addition, I want to draw attention of this debate by European and American scholars. This is certainly a factor in the questions that have dominated debates on agrarian change, irrespective of the orientation and intention of the scholars involved. I believe that the situation of African scholars Scholarship in these debates, agency to the different traditions, textured agrarian scholarship, pioneered by Achima Seje, Desalen Ramato, Samoyo, and Kojo Amano, to name only a few. This scholarship involved careful examination of what was actually happening in the African countryside and was not blinded by productivity statistics. This, together with a more recent feminist scholarship on land and agrarian issues, Zenet, Tadese, Lenoso, Tome, and several others are very good foundations on which to build an understanding of agrarian change. In what first recent developments in the scientific and policy context of agrarian studies, identify some of the land and labor issues that should inform the debate and makes assistance could be contested in arid and contested space than it was in the 1980s. When you learned the Lagos Plan of Action was in and by account policies of the Asian and the real consolidation of Africa's role as a producer of agricultural commodities and extractive division of labor. In this, we have now the AU's Agenda 2063 commits to structural transformation of agriculture. Part of the achievement aspiration, a prosperous Africa based on inclusive growth 
and sustainable development. Well, the Comprehensive Africa Agricultural Development Program, CADEP, launched in 2002, seeks to culture, issues of poverty reduction and food insecurity in Africa. In 2003, these goals and CADEP in general were adopted of the African Maputo Declaration on Agriculture in Africa and in, in the 2014 Malabo Declaration on Accelerated Agricultural Growth and Transformation. So declaration calls for a minimum of 10 budgets to agriculture and a commitment by countries to undertake activities that will result in an annual growth rate for all this for its neoliberal underpinnings and for only paying lip service to smallholder for the gifts to external partners and donors, the top-down government donor policy making it champions and the failure of most to achieve the 10% investment target. Doubt that CADIP has been a catalyst for sub-regional and national agricultural policy reforms and has entrenched agrarian transformation and industrialization as legitimate goals for African countries of these forms. These policy developments in agriculture have been accompanied by new instruments such as the Africa Mining Vision and the Continental Free Trade. They provide some counterpoints and entry points and for scholarly debates about agriculture in Africa. However, agricultural policy in African countries continues to be neoliberal with a clear preference for large-scale commercial agriculture and is age-dependent thus ceding policy space to donors. The USAID and the Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa are in, are in charge of import of agricultural policy in a country like through providing aid to the process, paying selectively for policy implementation. Policy making and implementation is of transnational corporations involved in agriculture as producers, as buyers of commodities, and as traders in agrochemicals and inputs. In relation to the scholarly context, recent developments in agrarian studies, a branch of scholarship that has been in steady decline in Africa for decades, the salience of the subject matter to our continent's current conditions and future are pertinent. The current explosion of scholarship of agrarian, on, on, about agrarian change in Africa by European and American scholars in what is known in African universities as international journals is very striking. Outlets such as the journals are thriving such a small group of dedicated scholars of agrarian change who are mostly based in South Africa. There's a new generation of African scholars beginning to turn their attention to this matter, and this is very good news. However, the renewed interest in agrarian trends has not yet had the momentum that an earlier period of the had. It is interest in agrarian transformation had been propelled by the fact that newly independent African countries prioritize agriculture and rural development under the influence of ascendant farmers' organizations, hoping to reap the benefits of independence. Secondly, agrarian studies in the social science influence and research in the agricultural sciences, which has grown in leaps and bounds within low research networks as funded and supported by awards of millions of research dollars over several decades. The success of each, perhaps, is perhaps because they are more suited to the purposes of agribusiness, governments, and donors in their focus on practical questions, improved seeds and other technologies, needs, hydrology and agro. While to the diffusion of innovations and are exercised by farmers for responses to new technologies. Issues of the conditions under which in particular the question of really engaged Shared consciences and the social sciences is productivity. While yields and productivity are certainly important, studied as part of the broader question of the social reproduction of farming households, 
This would examine the issue of who benefits from particular approaches to increase productivity. How do different approaches to improving productivity structure how the benefits are shared? Which approaches and measures would best stop the action of and their members, the production system, as well as the agrarian political economy? These really do not attract sufficient attention in the discussions of productivity. Also important, in addition to generating intractable debates about which skills of farming are the most productive and therefore most deserving of policy support and resources among large, medium, and small-scale farming, the focus on productivity has also framed discussions about women farmers. It has been policy efforts and expenditures on promoting women's access to productive resources that agriculture would benefit immensely for certain constraints. And often challenges in access to input and human capital, activity of Africa's agriculture by 10 to 20%. This has been replicated by countries from Kenya, Burkina Faso, and by the World Bank, FO and IFAD in natural source book. It is pretty increases labor input, capital investments, and have their time burdens reduced. And what makes their farms more or less or equally productive? I so long debated the instrumentalist arguments derived from such research. On the one hand, instrumentalist arguments are in negotiation of actors and they are easier to serve. patriarchal institutions than rights and citizenship. However, they have a silence. The reason in agrarian transformation signal development in neoliberal globalization. When the default crisis, banks and poor people, more for capital energy crisis, serving to wait. The triple crisis is for real and speculative investments of financial capital in the search of ever more profits and also to address some of the elements of the acquisition life farm that abundance continue in Africa. The meant that Africa has and this abundance land is another man has his own. Mafeje, for example, has long dismissed this, arguing that there's not much in Africa as is being made out. One, because of the patterns of settlement that are quite dense in certain parts of, of, of Africa, as well as farming practices with systems, as well as the introduction of agriculture. The fact that this discourse about land abandon directed in a moment of global tension, the search for land grabbing, the land rush, involved the usual suspects, transnational corporations and agribusinesses from the global north, but also new players, both South Korea, South America, from the EU, the United States, India, and South The places where the largest acquisitions of in Africa with regard to scale, everywhere in three years, 30 million of a figure of 37 for all acquisitions since 
on target. Because apart from being overtaken by time and the difficulties of collation, were under negotiation, acquired by not others with business models that involved locals as contract farmers. The much debated land matrix that tried kill and acquisitions using an observatory approach, which involved inviting information has come about the secrecy surrounding some of these acquisitions. That acquiring such land and by control of water sources in Africa to feed people on other continents was not controlled. It's a mark of how the economic if you could point to real or imagined new future cultures of globalization have changed the terms of input global food markets. This is all you can see. So it's not particular. The term resource nationalism is now being used pejoratively to describe this to describe state efforts to control the use of natural resources. The pro-business outlet, news outlet, CMBS, has on its website a 2040 article published in a section called The World's Biggest Risks, which defines resource nationalism and warns that it may be increasing in, in terms that leave no doubt that this is not a good development. That's what they said. Resource nationalism describes a government's effort to gain greater benefit from it. It's not, sometimes to the detriment of private companies. This can range from outright expropriation, when a government takes away a company's assets, or forms of appropriation, such as higher taxation or more arduous regulation. Article written by a Jessica Morris. In an outline course for A-level students online, resource nationalism is described by quoting someone called Andy Miller, described as a global tax leader, mining and metals from Ensign Young. And he says, resource nationalism has become a contagion, impacting the mining and metals industry across the globe. The industry needs to become more engaged in the analysis and management of this risk, which can place a heavy burden on existing operations and influence future decisions on where to invest. And the, the um, document goes on to cite examples of resource nationalism in Africa, which include South Africa's uh, tax windfall uh, profits on coal and platinum, Ghana's efforts to tax diamond and gold profits, and Australia's efforts in the areas of iron ore, nickel, and coal. For whom one might ask, is resource nationalism investigated? The idea that others have no qualms about identifying Africa's natural resources as an important aspect of their own strategies for development. While troubling, it's not surprising, as it has been possible for others to acquire what they need in Africa on their own terms since As Moyo and his colleagues wrote about land grabbing, this was the third scramble for land in Africa, the first being Africa's partition in 1884, and the different forms of colonization and land dispossession the continent experienced. And the second being a scramble for land in the 1980s, when economic liberalization policies intensified resource extraction and infrastructural projects, leading to more land dispossession and land use conflicts. The analysis offered by Moyo and his colleagues and several others drew attention to the long-standing control of Africa's economies generally and agriculture specifically by transnational capital, reinforced by the global economic governance regime as an important feature of globalization. The dominant framework de devised by Western scholars for analyzing land grab this, that kept on multiplying as the time went on. There was also an interest in which companies and governments were continents were the most affected and what quantum of land had been acquired in the terms of the acquisitions, the business models, and their interface with local producers, and how governments, traditional leaders, and the local elites were responding, how farmers and civil society were responding, and the effects of acquisitions on local production and agrarian economies. Since
this much of the recent scholarship was made possible by funding from Western donor sources. African researchers played catch up as members of research consortia led mainly by European researchers. The research on land grabbing on the basis of an autocritique of the first and second round of studies soon turned to studies of models of agricultural commercialization and their merits and demerits. And it led to a re-appreciation re of contract farming strategy for African farmers and transnational capital. This new lease of life of, for contract farming does not focus on its histories and itineraries and is not engaged in a critical assessment of the voluntary standards and corporate social responsibility activities of transnational corporations which have enabled them to acquire the social license to operate in potentially hostile territories. Meanwhile, a strand of the scholarship is focused on challenging arguments about privileging support for smallholder agriculture. After taking a random piece of rightly cited scholar of agrarian studies, Dirkon, it's a working paper published by a very influential node of, Africa, of scholarship on Africa, the Center for the Study of African Economies at Oxford University, titled Agriculture and Africa Development, a Review of Theories, and it's my point about how different questions can lead to different answers. Then and Golan write in magisterial tones, and I quote them here. Many previous authors have argued that Africa's development strategies must focus on agriculture because the sector is large and important. We find this line of argument deeply unconvincing. Even if the sector is vast and even if it employs people, the critical question must be whether there are useful and feasible interventions that the public sector can take to promote growth and equity through agriculture that are superior to other feasible interventions and policies. Others argue that agriculture matters as a supply of food, an essential good, or that agricultural development is the key to reducing poverty and inequality. While understanding fully the arguments that support these ideas, we note again that the question of public policy is ultimately whether resources invested in agriculture achieve it more cost effectively than the same resources invested elsewhere in the economy. If growth in agriculture is especially difficult to achieve, then the development strategy concentrating on agricultural investments may lead only to wasteful expenditures of resources. This does not conclude that agriculture is not an appropriate sector for strategic investments, nor are we opposed in any sense to policies that would prioritize the sector. We simply argue that there's little evidence that will support or oppose the claim that public investments in agriculture culture will generate greater improvements in social welfare than investments in other sectors." Unquote. I think these authors have turned the real question on its head to reach this agnostic and cavalier approach to a, a situation which is no joking matter. It's not that we need to convince ourselves that investing in peasants is the best approach to agriculture because it has never actually consistently and fully done before. So this is not a question that can actually be answered. What we can answer though, and should liberalism can we deliver de decent life views and structural transformation in Africa. Now I'll contrast this view from Dekon and his colleague to a view from ASSETS, the African Center for Economic Transformation. This is um, a quite neoliberal in his view. It writes in its flagship report, African Transformation Report, subtitled Agriculture Primary Transformation. And again, I quote them to, to make the point. For the most part, agriculture in Africa remains backward and tied to a commodity exporting model that countries are trying to move away from. Yet, many, yet for many countries, agriculture presents the easiest path to industrialization and economic transformation. Increasing productivity and output in a modern agricultural sector would beyond improving food security and the balance of payments through reduced food imports and increased exports, sustainable processing, cultural inputs, and a host of up services upstream and downstream from farms, creating employment and boosting incomes across the country. 
Many of today's successful economies follow that path to economic transformation. It is even relevant for Africa today, given its factor endowments and emerging global trends in manufacturing technology, demand patterns, and the location.
even because in 2019 there are like
we have to make our own weapons of the We're not going to have those kind of attacks from here. They are the means, um, we are the best of our own. 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 I'm <laughs> 
Thank mm-hmm. you. 